Um, I want to introduce myself. I'm Bill Valerio, the director of Woodmere Art Museum, and thank all of you for joining us tonight, and also to thank our speaker this evening, Barbara Willannon, my good friend that I've worked on many projects with. And when the idea of a Group 55 um, and Sam Feinstein exhibition you know, blossomed as an idea, we knew that the guest curator needed to be Barbara. And I think that will be borne out in the course of this evening because there's really nobody else who has done the kind of historic research and piecing together of modernism um, in Philadelphia the way that Barbara has. Barbara is the world expert. And I say that knowing that I am not exaggerating, which I sometimes do, but Barbara is the world expert on Arthur B. Carls, the very important modernist of the city of Philadelphia, who plays an important role in the story that we're going to hear tonight. And um, I just wanna say thank you again to Barbara. Thank you all for joining us tonight. Um, it is my honor to also thank Hilsey Tao, Woodmere's Curator of Education, who's going to do a more formal introduction of Barbara, but um, I am just so happy to be here. I'm going to put myself on mute. Thank you all again, and um, sit back, and I'm going to enjoy the lecture like everyone else. Thank you, Bill. Um, just some housekeeping before we begin. I want everybody to know that as Dr. Wolanin speaks, there is a an icon at the bottom of your screen. It says Q&A. If you have comments, questions, um, there will be time at the end of the talk for us to, I will be collecting them and, and then um, sharing them with Dr. Wolanin and, and whomever else may want to join in or write a comment in the Q&A. So just take note of that. Um, as Bill said, Dr. Wolanin is a distinguished art historian. Um, and the guest has is has been has served as the guest curator for our exhibition of Group 55 and Mid-Century Modernism in Philadelphia. Um, she has written extensively in Arthur B. Call, Carl's. Um, her volume, Arthur B. Call's Painting with Color, is the must-read on Arthur B. Call's. It is, you know, it's it's a wonderful story and the, his journey, his, the way his work evolves is, is told in a very eloquent way. Um, Dr. Wallanen also actually helped curate and she wrote the essay for an exhibition that was at Woodmere in 2000 on um, the orchestration of color, the paintings of Arthur B. Carls. Um, so she is, she is, I think, the person, the person you want to read about Carl's, and you will see his legacy in a lot of her talk today. Um, Dr. Wallanen did do extensive research, as Bill said, on Group 55, and she tells, and today, you, tonight, you will be enjoying a, her fascinating story of a group of Philadelphia artists who came together through their passion about abstraction. They organized exhibitions. They sought to educate the public about what was then a very challenging um, approach to art, abstraction. And Dr. Wallanen has also written the catalog for the essay, the exhibition catalog, um, that will be published this month. It was delayed due to the pandemic, but I think it's, um, I think by the end of the month, um, perhaps uh, um, Rachel can let, our, our curator can let us, can confirm that or not. But that, the catalog essay does provide the first detailed account of the accomplishments of this group and the Philadelphia abstract artists. So please welcome Dr. Wolanin. Okay, thank you. So I'm on, all right. I'm looking forward to telling you about my process of discovery for, of Group 55. And um, it has been a real process. I sometimes felt like I was putting a puzzle piece together and my collaborators in this process have been Pat Stark Feinstein, who's uh, Sam Feinstein's widow and her assistant, Victoria Shu. We spent really a couple of years gathering every bit of information we could about these artists and what happened with the group. This is the title page of the um, 
exhibition catalog. So my part of it is that center part, the group 55 mid-century abstraction that I worked on. And this is the beautiful room and the wood mirror with the show, which is just wonderful. And I hope if you're in the area that you'll put your mask on, make a reservation and come in and see it. You have to see these paintings in person. They're so much more exciting than what I can show you on the screen. But there are actually three shows, one, and they're all up now. One is at the Springside Chestnut Hill Academy of Sam Feinstein's early years. And he and his wife, Barbara Crawford, taught there at the Academy. And that is a beautifully put together show. And the third part uh, has a wonderful essay in the catalog by Pat Feinstein, which is Sam Feinstein's later work after Group 55, but just a spectacular realm of these beautiful paintings. So what was Group 55? This, this is the first poster for the show. This is announcing the very beginning of the group. And the, I'm enlarging some of the details. One of the details was a quote where they're talking about Every great art differs from its predecessor, involves a transformation of taste. These artists really felt that they were transforming taste, changing kind of the history of art. And they summarized their goal as discussing contemporary, con contemporary creative problems among themselves and with the public. And they had they did this educating the public and talking with the public through forums, which were panel discussions with audience participation and exhibitions. And I, as I will tell you, this, the group um, started in 1955, but in 1957, a lot of the artists moved into a, really an offshoot group that called themselves Philadelphia Abstract Artists. But because it was the same artists and a lot of the same ideas, I decided these are this is all part of the one story. And I think the artists felt that way too. You might wonder why in the world where I've gotten interested in something called Group 55. And it is because two, I when I was doing my dissertation on Arthur B. Carls, I looked for everybody who knew him, particularly as students, and I interviewed them. Two of his students I interviewed many times, I got to know well, and I wrote about their work were Keita Broadhead and Jane Piper. You can see their names on that poster where all the first original members were listed. There was a third Carl student, I only talked to him once on the phone, but he also was in this show. So three Carl students in the show. And I remember very clearly when I was interviewing them, the way that they said I was in group 55 and their faces kind of lit up and they were very proud of having their work looked at seriously discussed. I never asked them any more questions about it. Now I wish I had, but I didn't. So um, that's partly why I was really intrigued. I knew it was something important to both of them and wanted to know what, what it was all about. As um, I was mentioned, I turn my dissertation into the 1983 catalog for the Pennsylvania Academy, Arthur B. Carl's Painting with Color, and then the 2000 show for Hollis Taggart Galleries in New York came to the Woodmere, which was great. And Carl's actually lived right down the street from the Woodmere, right off Germantown Avenue on East Evergreen Avenue at the end of, end of his life, his last home. But sort of ironically, until Bill Valerio came as director, the Woodmere did not own one single painting by Carls. Now they, uh, the museum has beautiful paintings by him and a lot of works on paper and you know much more interest in, in him. The show actually with the paintings of Arthur B. Carls also had a extensive exhibition of Carls students, which was really good that Bill Scott uh, curated. So a lot of people do not know who Arthur B. Carls was. He was born in 1882 and he taught at the Pennsylvania Academy from 1917 to 1925. And he had gone to Paris early on and he became a modernist. He loved the uh, post-impressionists, the Fauves, the Cubists. He defended the Armory Show. And there was kind of a war going on at the Academy between the modernists, Carl's and some of his colleagues and the more academic teachers that believed in the life drawing classes and realism and be much more academic. 
and eventually Carls was fired in 1925. Keita Broadhead was one of the students who quit the academy and went and helped form a private class for Carls for, to teach. And she actually off and on kept studying with him, hiring him to come critique her work until he stopped painting. He stopped painting in 1941. He had a fall and a stroke and never painted again after that, although he lived on until 1952. But he was a stellar presence in Philadelphia because there were his first show, solo shows in Philadelphia didn't happen till that period um, towards the end of his life. Now, interestingly, Charles Grafley's daughter, Dorothy Grafley, is an important part of my discovery process for this ex exhibition because um, she was a big, um, crit sorry, big critic in Philadelphia and, oops, wait, oh goodness, what did I do? Help, help, help. Barbara, you're good, you're good. No, it's not up. But go advance on your slide. You're on a slide, I think. No, I hit something, sorry. Okay, right, go there. There you go, it just was up. I know, but it's not the right one. Well, you can go back once you right. get to it. Okay, so now we go back. But I gotta go to the beginning, all the way no. to the beginning. No. No. You don't you don't have to, but okay. Well, I was at that was the last slide, so sorry. I'm sorry, everybody. You're gonna get a preview of everything. Okay, so Dorothy Grafley um, was the um, daughter of Charles Grafley, and she wrote for Art in Art Digest before Sam Feinstein, and she wrote and published an art newsletter called Art in Focus that I went through every single one to find out about the artists, the exhibitions. She also wrote for the, the newspaper, so she was a big voice. She loved her father and his tradition, and she was pretty skeptical about the abstract painting, but she did help uh, publicize it in her, her, her newsletter. So Arthur B. Carls um, knew Hans Hoffman and Hans Hoffman is also part important part of the story because Sam Feinstein and a number of the other members of group 55 had studied with him. This picture so shows Carls with a beard, Hans Hoffman and Carl's daughter Mercedes who all spent the summer together in 1934 and Mercedes told me that she got Hoffman back painting with color that summer. This is before Feinstein studied with him. Hoffman admired Carls tremendously and he was considered to be a prophet of abstract expressionism by a lot of these artists that were the expressionists. And you can see that in this painting that's called his abstraction, last painting that's at the Hirshhorn Museum, how he was moving right into that movement and then he stopped painting end of 1941. I mean, he really was a pioneer and he was known by the other artists. So when after Carl's died, there was a big memorial exhibition in Philadelphia in 1953. And I read this wonderful review of that exhibition, which was written by someone called Sam Feinstein. But I had no idea who he was. I could never find out who he was. But you know, I, I never forgot it. And one day, time, just by chance, I happened to meet Pat Stark Feinstein at a conference. And I finally saw Sam Feinstein's paintings and found out who he was, his amazing paintings. And I could see why he understood Carl's color better than anyone else. But all of these artists would have seen Carl's paintings there at that show. And this beautiful painting that's now in the Woodmere collection and in the show, the abstract bouquet was also in the museums in 1955 and 1958. And I did a little detail. This is a detail on the left of Carl's painting of abstract bouquet compared with one of Sam Feinstein's paintings of this, of this time period. And you can see where how Carl's was playing with color, putting one color next to another, very much aware of how the colors interrelated and changed each other, which is what Feinstein was working with, interested in the textures of paint, the dynamic movement of, of the painting where your eye keeps moving and moving around. 
which very similar kind of ideas for what um, Feinstein kept pursuing in his own work. Feinstein was a, um, what he, he had uh, written about Carl's, with that Carl's, his, his painting has the supple rhythm of a symphony by Mozart. Its component hues are interwoven into a cadence of resonant color. Its forms always seem alert as if impelled by some inner necessity into an elegant blossoming. Kind of what he was, as I said, doing in his own paintings. So um, a, a lot of the paintings that I'm showing you tonight, I'm just putting the names of the artists if they're in the show. These are all paintings in the show from this period. If they're from another collection, I'll, I'll, I'll putting that in, but I'm not putting all the uh, titles and everything um, for now. Um, Sam Feinstein was a remarkable, thoughtful, articulate, well-read, passionate about painting. He spent summers in Provincetown with Hans Hoffman, uh, was one of Hoffman's ma uh, major students, and he was a teacher himself, a very dedicated teacher. Naturally, when the Group 55 started, he was elected president. Raymond Handler considered himself a co-founder and he had actually been in Paris after serving in the army in the war. He came to Philadelphia. He had his own gallery where he's showing abstract expressionists. Again, very articulate. He moved out of Philadelphia after uh, soon, so he didn't stay there, but he was part of the founding. I think also Mitchell Wagman um, probably was one of the founders. I have to give credit to Barbara Crawford, uh, Sam Feinstein's wife, because she was certainly a collaborator. I think Sa Sanford Greenberg was another one, and Sam Freed. Now, I don't have a picture of Sam Freed. And one of the frustrating things about this process of discovery of Group 55 was it's really hard to find out about some of these artists. You know, we and um, we, Pat um, Feinstein and I looked in every, you know, we looked in reviews surveyed all these newspapers. We found a lot of reviews of the artists. We tried to talk to families. We're very helpful where we could. Um, but some people like Sam Freed, I'd like to know a lot more about. And in la last winter, I was planning to come and start going to all the archives in Philadelphia and seeing if, what else I could dig out. And guess what? Pandemic happened. So a lot of this had to be done online. The All of these Group 55 artists were oops, um, very aware of what was going on in New York City. As people know, right after World War II, all of a sudden things are happening with artists like Jackson Pollock, his drip paintings. They were all meeting together at the Cedar Tavern. They started their 8th Street Club. They had panels. Um, Hendler was actually on one of the panels. Hendler was a good friend of Franz Klein. He even got him to come down to Philadelphia to teach. They shared, had studios near each other. So the Philadelphia artists often went up to New York. A lot of these artists were going there. They, were, they got into the panel discussions and things like that. And I think the club and the idea of artists getting together and um, discussing, you know, all the big ideas about art and philosophy certainly inspired what Group 55 did. But there was a big difference. The New York artists had the, they gathered together the artists and the critics, and you had to be a member of the club or you had to be invited. Philadelphia artists, their goal was to educate the public, the wider public, much more of a kind of Philadelphia idea. They felt it was kind of their community service. They felt people needed to understand abstract art. They wanted the people to appreciate what they were doing and why it was important. It's a very different kind of ethos to what the Philadelphia artists were doing. So, and Sam Feinstein actually lived in New York during the week and from 1953 to mid 55, he was writing for Art Digest. He, so he was writing about the New York artists and the Philadelphia artists and getting to know them well that way. So I, I sort of think that when the um, Art Digest changed hands and he was no longer doing that, all of a sudden he had energy to put into this new group. So another wonderful thing about Sam Feinstein is he didn't throw anything out. He saved everything. And this was wonderful. And I did get to go up and use this archive with uh, Pat and she has uh, saved it as, 
it, you know, too, and it eventually will be archived, hopefully, at the Archives of American Art. But here is the very first postcard up on the upper left. Meeting at the Dubin Gallery Friday. Bring your ideas about aims, activities, and a name for the group. And then the next one in the fall, when they met, they said, we're going to vote on the name for the group. So they just decided on Group 55 because they first met in 1955. And um, I think they felt like their art was the art of now, the art of their time. So, so some of the many things Feinstein saved is little sketches trying to create a logo for the group. And then the collage on the right is something he, he brushed ink on paper and he collaged it together and he made this burst, you know, to give the sense of, of energy for the group. So I don't think they used the word branding then, but they were trying to, to do something to make this group recognizable. So using that burst, I, I wanted to connect how the members would have known each other. As I mentioned, a number of, number of them, including Feinstein, were students of Hans Hoffman, and a lot of other ones were students of Sam Feinstein, who was teaching in Philadelphia, including Jack Marison, who's in the show. Also, these are all the artists that were the original members of Group 55 that Sam Feinstein had written about in our Art Digest. So he knew them. And this was like a, you know invited group. You had to be invited to get into it or later members had to be sort of juried in. They had to show their art and everybody had to vote to let them in. So it wasn't just uh, anybody could join up. Another thing that I think connected them, a lot of the members are, were Jewish. They were either first or second generation Russian or Ukrainian, like um, Feinstein was uh, Russian, like Louis Kahn, who was one of the speakers. And there was this, you know, very active Jewish intellectual circles in Philadelphia that was uh, very interesting. And um, I think people interested in ideas and interested in, again, that idea of sharing them with the public. Some of the members were printmakers. Here are three of the major ones. A.P. Hankins was actually the oldest member of the group, born in 1898. And um, Sankowski was the one who had been Carl's student at the academy. So there were printmakers and painters. One sculptor had started to join, but he dropped out when he saw it really was all, everybody else was two dimensional. One of the things that really interests me because I have a big interest in women artists is that almost half of this group were female. It's pretty remarkable. You think this is 1955, way before the uh, feminism of the 1970s or anything like that. And here were these women and they weren't just in the group. They were taking prominent roles, leadership roles, getting solo exhibitions. They were really treated as equals, which I think is, is wonderful. Margot Allman on the left was the youngest member of the group. And she is, still has a show up now at the Delaware Art Museum, a solo exhibition of her work. So that's really amazing. Margaret Milliken, we didn't get one of her painting, weren't able to get one of her paintings, but I love this photograph of her with her great big painting on the easel. And Ruth Zion, who was painting as a woman then, didn't find out a lot about her, except she painted under a lot of different names. She was kind of tricky, but the painting that was found for the show is just really beautiful and amazing. There are some of the women that were these original members also, also then became active in the offshoot group in the Philadelphia Abstract Artists. So this would be the key to Broadhead, Jane Piper I've talked about, Doris Stoffel you'll hear more about, and Fran Lockman, who is one of Feinstein's students. And some of the other members who were the original Group 55 members, like Barbara Crawford, of course, didn't go into the offshoot group. Patricia Evans Mangione only showed in the first show. And Bernice Anderson, who was another loyal uh, student of Feinstein, had a solo exhibition. Here's the flyer for it, but we did not, weren't able to find work about by her or very much about her. So I want to make a little plea that anybody who's an artist or who has somebody in their family who's an artist, it's really important, even though it takes a lot of time, people's works need to be saved, it needs to be cataloged, inventoried, and all their documents about their career and their lives need to be saved and archived if possible so that future art historians can find them. The group really wanted to publicize what they were doing. And one of the neatest things they did to publicize the show 
was that they put paintings by the group 55 members in the Blum department store windows. Mitchell Wagman suggested to his friend Michael Silberti to do this and Silberti saved the photographs that he had made at the time. And if you look at the one on the right, it has a Sam Feinstein painting in it. And you can see this, the Burst logo there on the floor. So this is really remarkable. Everybody walking down Chestnut Street, you know, got excited about Group 55. So there were actually 15 paintings altogether in the, in the store windows. Um, so here's Silberti, and he then joined the group um, shortly thereafter. And this painting that's in the show called Group 55 might have even been the one that he showed to get accepted into the group. So when the um, exhibition opened in January, um, we only have one photograph of it. Th thank goodness um, Feinstein did save this one. This one shows his painting called Black Dominant that was talked about in the reviews, but we um, don't know where the painting is now. And this is the uh, building today where the gallery was. The gallery was called the Dubin Lush Gallery and it had just been incorporated. But the person that really welcomed Group 55 was a man named Hank Dubin. Henry P. Dubin. And he had had galleries in other locations. He had exhibited some of these artists before and he let them have their meetings there. He had the exhibitions and they had the first forum. I actually met Hank Dubin when I was working on Carl's because he had exhibited Carl's um, actually in part of the Group 55 exhibits. But I didn't ask him about Group 55 because I didn't know about it then, but um, I wish I had now, but I did meet him. Um, so in addition to the exhibition that was well reviewed and it's actually only in the reviews a lot of times that I could find out who was in some of the group shows, what the names of their paintings were, what they looked like at all. So um, finding those was a really big part of the um, uh, putting the story together. The forum on January 12th had some big speakers. One was Louis Kahn, the architect. And there is a um, chap one essay in the catalog about him. Then we had a talk about that last week that was really good. And George Rockberg, who was a serial composer and at the University of Pennsylvania. These were big names. And in addition, there were four of the painters. So group 50, five had the idea that abstract painting was part of this new world they were in after the war where all these fields were doing new things painting uh, uh, philosophy architecture dance music were all changing into new these new modern forms and they wanted people to understand how they were all related so um, when rockberg talked about this kind of music the history of modern music he went all the way, went up to John Cage and to music being made with tape recorders. And he talked about music could have an abstract score. But we con the architect and this model is part of the exhibition. He spoke in a very abstract way, actually in a way, but he spoke about creating space through architecture and would make statements like that which a thing wants to be is a powerful beginning of a problem. It's the spirit of it, the why aspect of the whole problem. And the what aspect is the order and the design is the means. And space was also something the painters were, of course, always talking about the space being created on their canvases. Then the painters would talk and they each gave a um, presentation and then they um, opened it up for questions and discussions. After these forums, the, when they had their monthly membership meeting, they would always discuss whether they thought they were successful or not. And they people thought the most lively part was when there was a discussion going on. So one of the people in the, um, the discussion was um, Raymond Hendler. And what uh, they had the show up all around them. And he pointed to a painting by Jane Piper, which we don't have, but I think similar to this one, Study in Red, which the Pennsylvania Academy had just purchased. And he, he, Hendler was talking about the differences between an abstract painting, abstract expressionist painting, a non-objective painting, non-representational painting. 
And he's pointed out how in the Jane Piper, you could see some of the still life objects, like in this one, you can see a lemon and some maybe uh, dishes and, and objects. And so that hers would be an abstraction from something she was looking at where he said his own paintings were very different and he would call them non-representational. They weren't from looking at anything. So these are two are the Raymond Hendler paintings in the show. At the discussion, um, Feinstein said, the canvas is nature in itself. It's not just an echo of nature. He says, for that, just take a picture, to just take a photograph. So believing that these talks were important and groundbreaking, Feinstein arranged to have them tape recorded. And then he got his poor wife, Barbara Crawford, to type up a transcript from the tapes, which is a very difficult thing to do. So you look here, this is the last page of the transcript, Real Five. She typed up 83 pages of this thing. And it, I, this is really kind of funny because she's typing away and um, about at the very end, non-representational painting is a whole new world of painting, um, the same as representational was. And then she types, and more of the same, Sam quotes from New York Times, Oppenheimer, and it's 3.30, Monday morning, I can't finish, the typewriter has to be returned. So you can just imagine the effort they were putting into this. Not, not all of, not the other forms weren't transcribed, transcribed so completely. Some of them had some transcripts and there's some of those in the catalog, more of the details. They were also very businesslike. They had their membership meetings and they took minutes at a secretary. Kita Broadhead was the secretary. Here's her minutes and her handwriting. And they, you know, tried to get publicity out. And they, here's the publicity for their forum number two. So they now, oh, I forgot the big thing was that at the Dubin Gallery, they had these big speakers. They had that little townhouse and people were cramming in. They said they had 200 people who couldn't get in. They were left out in the street trying to listen through the window. And maybe a hundred people got in at the most. Okay, so they decided they had to have a bigger space. So for forum two, they found out they could reserve space in the auditorium of the free library, which could hold almost 400 people. So here's their, again, using the burst as their sort of their logo. Um, they put a little sign, that little uh, thing that's on the side I put there, they're saying it tripled seating capacity, theater comfort in the free library, but it's you gotta come on time because we have to end when the library closes. So that was one of the disadvantages. Now they're branching out to having a pediatrician, Dr. Joseph Lachman, which you can probably guess was Fran Lachman's husband. Robert Walker was an art historian who taught at Swarthmore, Doris Stoffel, the painter, and Sam Feinstein. And um, so they were all excited about having this big space, but what happened, there was a huge snowstorm, which they called a blizzard that night. So only a hundred people made it. So form three, they repeated the same topic and which was the artist's vision and the public's views had the same speakers. Doris Staffel had been uh, elected to be the moderator of the, these panels and Jane Piper's painting, again, got a lot of attention and, and were part of the, the discussion. <clears throat> So in their meeting, they decided they wanted more attention even on just painting. So the next one, Form 4, they picked four painters to have their work discussed. discussed. And I forgot to tell you, they always wanted to have paintings to, at the discussions, at the forums. So at the library, they had to set up easels and bring the paintings in and set up on evils, easels. So these are the four painters that so had their work discussed this time. And again, you can see two of them are women, which I think is really remarkable. The wonderful Michael uh, Mitchell Wagman painting that's in the um, show, this slide doesn't do it justice. Sam Feinstein again was one of the people. So you're kind of noticing Sam Feinstein seems to be part of all of these forums and discussions and everything. They actually had kind of a fifth forum 
which was they called a round table. And um, this is right at the end of the year, end of 1956. Mitchell Wagman had had a solo exhibition at the gallery. And um, this time they had, instead of having Sam Feinstein give the uh, slide lecture, which he liked to do, he liked to get slides of the whole history of art and show how all the masterpieces by Giotto or uh, El Greco or anybody that you can talk about, if you analyze them, it's the abstract forms, the colors, the shapes, the directions that make them so powerful. And that in a way, what the, they were doing with non-representational painting was part of that continuum. So Bechtel also got slides, did a talk similar. Feinstein was on this one again, Sam Fried, Mitchell Wagman. And um, so that was the end of the 1956. The end of the year, Sam Fried had said, I honestly do believe Group 55 was the most important thing that developed in Philadelphia in the art season 55-56. Hank Dubin was moving his gallery again, and he moved it to Irving Street, 1319, 1321 Irving Street, and the building is still there. And it had been a stable, a city stable, where through that rounded sort of garage door, that's where the horses and the carriages would have gone in. And then the gallery, you would enter on that little door on the right and then have to go up. There was apparently a ramp upstairs, big room upstairs. And Dorothy Bradley nicely gave a really detailed description of the space and what they were trying to do. And um, she said there was a big room that could be divided into either two different separate galleries or one big, big exhibition space. The other big difference was that Dubin had asked Sam Feinstein to help him run the gallery. And Sam Feinstein had agreed to do that. And so because of that, he resigned as president and um, C. Ronald Bechtel, Ron Bechtel was elected as the, as the president. Now, just in talking about the space, when the time that I met Dubin, I just still remember it vividly. It was in the winter, it was dark, whatever my appointment was, pitch dark. I finally found the door. I went in and went upstairs and I had no idea. This was where the group 55 shows had been. And at that point, it looked like a big warehouse filled, piled up with stuff and everything. But I did talk to Dubin and it turns out he must have bought this building. He lived there the rest of his life. It's still there. So they started calling the gallery Dubin Gallery 55 as, as a shortened name for it and all their announcements and everything. So, and they um, had wanted everybody to come in, pitch, help fix up paint and things like that to get it ready. So 1957, this new space, there's opens with a show of Keita Broadhead. And, um, and what they would do at the meetings, they would also discuss, have a discussion of the, her art. And this is a postcard with her writing on it. Say, don't forget, you're gonna discuss my paintings you know, at, at the meeting. So there was also a show of uh, the group show of the group 55. So part of the catalog, something I did, I tried to like figure out how many shows did all these artists get in? Who was the most active? But it turns out if it was a group show that wasn't reviewed, I couldn't always, I had no way to know who was really in it. So a lot of the artists um, were in a lot more shows than I, you know, I could count, but I was trying to really figure out who was important part of the group, who was there, how long they were there, things like that. Believe it or not, in January, they had a second Group 55 exhibition. This was at the Community Arts Center in Wallingford. It's about nine miles outside of the, uh, of the city. And um, friend Lachman had ta taught there. And they, Sam Feinstein gave a talk again, sort of tying abstract art with the history of art. You can see the photograph in the review, the woman is holding up a Sanford Greenberg painting, which is somewhat similar to the one beautiful one we have in the show that's kind of an abstract still life with white lines on a black background, very strong painting. You look at these paintings, you think these hold up well with any of the New York artists or anything like that. Well, what's interesting about Wallingford, they also had a panel discussion and people were very nervous about it because this was the first time abstract art had even been shown there and people didn't like it. They would say things like when um, Dr. Lachman was on that forum, I forgot to tell you the big question. And I've had people ask me this, just this recently a friend asked me, 
you know, how, what's so good about abstract art? Any kid can do an abstract painting. You know, what's the, dif what's the difference between what's, what you're seeing here and what any ch child can do? So that was one of the focus of the big discussions and about how um, the, the idea really was that in these um, paintings that these artists were doing, every part of it was thought through and important. And if you changed one little spot of color, it would change the whole composition. If you changed an inch or a line, it would change the whole thing. And it was just this whole kind of balancing process uh, of building the painting very thoughtfully and, um, you know, that it was not just something that we people are slapping, you know, paint on the canvas. There's a lot, lot to it. Um, but um, you can see, as I said, how prominent Sam Feinstein had been. And there was, Bechtel had written him a letter and was sort of complaining. And some of the people felt that Feinstein was not just a strong leader. Some of them thought he was dogmatic. They didn't always agree with him. And um, they, some of them got upset because there was a postcard that went out. And, you know, in those days, you, you maybe had two del mail deliveries a day. So postcards, you didn't have internet. You had your meetings on postcards. So the group 55 meeting, and it says, absence at this meeting without written notification will automatically indicate your termination of membership from Fran Lackman per Sam Feinstein. And somebody did write a letter. Dottie Feldman wrote a letter. She wasn't going to be there, but she decided she was going to drop out. And we think that maybe what Sam Feinstein was trying to do is figure out who was really in the group. The first show was 24. There were about maybe 16, 17 people coming to meetings. He wanted to see who was going to continue in the new year. But Ron Bechtel wrote on this postcard that he archived, this was the end of group 55. Sam Feinstein made a mess of it. So you can see there is some antagonism between the two to these two men that were both very intelligent, very dedicated to painting. Ron Bechtel um, then had been elected president. He asked for the membership list. He asked for the financial records. Then on February 1st, he and Sam Freed, Sanford Greenberg, Mitchell Wag Wagman sent a letter to all the members and said, we are resigning from group 55. And then the next day they sent another letter out to all the members saying, would you come and to a meeting to form a new group. And that's what became the Philadelphia Abstract Artist. Back to always mimeographed all of his um, things that he sent out for the group. And this is 12 artists that every single one were part of group 55. So really it is the same group. Back to was uh, like an engineer, consulting engineer, one time called himself a mathematician. But also, even though he wasn't a painting full time, he spent time every day painting. He was very, very concerned about it. He had his first big uh, solo show at a different gallery, 1956. And I thought it'd be interesting to see the um, uh, uh, Bechtel painting versus one of the Sam Feinsteins that are in the show. They had a very different approach to painting. Bechtel would start with a sketch and then he, like this one, he would, each painting would have a limited palette of colors. You can see this is greens and shades of red and some yellows and black and white. And um, this is kind of a still life, but it's not flowers and fruit, probably gears, maybe the kind of machine parts he was working with in this job. Beautifully done. It's kind of like a synthetic cubism cubist painting really works well as a painting, but done very carefully. Whereas Sam Feinstein didn't know, didn't do sketches. He had maybe a feeling or an idea or something in nature that inspired him that he wanted to express. Then he would start laying on color and then laying another color next to it, another color over it. And a lot of times put it on with a palette knife and build up the textures, just keep working and working until it seemed successful to him when he would finally stop. So very totally different ways of approaching the paintings. But um, Sam Feinstein, his big new thing in February for the Dubin Gallery 55, he managed to get three galleries in New York City to lend paintings of, of major abstract expressionist artists. And again, he gave a talk about them. This was in the, the Dubin's gallery. 
the day of the opening was the exact same day that um, the Bechtel had called for the meeting of the new group. Again, Feinstein saved one photograph, luckily we have, of this show. It's the only one we have really showing some of the paintings. And there's one of them we've been able to identify, which was the Hans Hoffman in the show, um, which I show you here. And uh, I think maybe it's the Franz Klein next to it. We know all the artists in it. Uh, we don't have the list. Now, Dubin, as far as we know, Dubin gallery records weren't saved. Um, and it would have been interesting to have all of those. One of the big surprises was right before the Woodmere show opened, um, Margaret Milliken's family lent a little tiny little photo album and it was the opening of the abstract expression show that Sam Feinstein did. You can see him, he's the person with the, um, here with the dark hair and these two paintings, there's one at the center. Um, and you can see the people coming in through the little rounded door, the coat racks, you know, how busy it is, all the conversations going on. Maybe people that came down from New York and we still haven't figured out who all the people are. But if anybody does, some of these pictures are in the catalog, It'd be really fun to know, but um, it really gives you a sense of the openings that they were having. One thing about Philadelphia, they were much more sedate. They would have wine, maybe wine and cheese or like some kind of a punch at the openings. Uh, New York artists were much more rowdy than nobody in Philadelphia was, really weren't meeting at bars. They weren't getting into fights and arguments, much more civilized. So um, then in addition to these exhibitions that were continuing at the Dubin Gallery, um, they. Feinstein developed a series of programs and now tying them in with music where they actually had musical programs. So here's one where Joseph Castaldo was a good friend of Feinstein's as a music director. And he had two uh, people from the Philadelphia Orchestra playing Marcelo de Cray on the harp and the horn. And if you can read the program, Castaldo had one of his pieces. And I like kind of down at the bottom, they also, when you, at the end of the concert, they had refreshments. Um, so very interesting, very kind of intellectual thinking of a, you know, kind of a small concert with an unusual um, choice of doing harp and horn together, which didn't usually happen. Then the next one also directed by Castaldo um, was a, a piano pieces with Natalie Henderis, who was a well, you know, became a well-known pianist and uh, taught at the University of Pennsylvania. And this was one of the um, actually African American, which was interesting. And so again, a program that had some of the modern composers and again, Castaldo. One thing that I wondered about was um, why um, the artists, none of these programs had jazz in them. Now, like Barbara Crawford loved jazz. People talked about her playing the records all the time. There was a lively jazz scene in Philadelphia. In fact, Bechtel had painted this um, 7th Street cellar in 1951. And was, this is the, I found in his archives on the Woodmere um, program for the juried show. He said, this was the first painting that was, he got juried in to a, to a show. And now the, his family has donated it to the museum. Um, so, you know, it's just was a question and I think it was partly like the tone of a lot of the forums and the programs was more academic sort of high level jazz was new it didn't have the academic credibility that now it does you have it in universities and things like that. And, but the artists were listening to it they were going to the concerts that you know Jackson Pollock painted to jazz so it was part certainly part of their, their milieu and their life. Um, they had a solo exhibition of Margaret Milliken um, at, the, at the gallery. Again, the women also getting the solos as well as the men. And then the Philadelphia Abstract Artists did not organize their first exhibition until October. And this is their first poster. And they had it at the Carlin Galleries. Robert Carlin had also been exhibiting some of the modern, you know, more modern abstract artists. But if you look at the names on the poster for the first exhibition, again, all artists that had been in Group 55. Second exhibition they had at the Fleischer Art Memorial. Again, all the same artists that we've already seen. And um, 
um, the um, Philadelphia abstract artists and all these artists also, there was a series of talks that started at the print club and people like Louis Kahn spoke at that. And so people were going to that. There was another outlet for sort of continuation in a way of what um, Feinstein had been doing with the forums. But group 55 is still going on even in 1958, even with the um, group Philadelphia Abstract Artist shows. And the Philadelphia Abstract Artist at their first meeting was interesting because Bechtel had asked them, write down, they just took scraps of paper, what do you want out of this new group? And he saved the scraps of paper, which are wonderful. And they, some of them wrote down things like, no programs. I think there were a lot of work. They wanted to paint, they were teaching, they were painting, had families, maybe it was too much. They wanted to discuss their work and their studios and they their goal was really to have one show a year, which is what they did. And they organized those very well. They socialized a little bit more than maybe um, and had fun with it, but they did, they sort of pulled back from what Feinstein was doing that was so dedicated and so serious. The people left in the group were mostly his students. Um, so he continued on with in the Dubin Gallery and had a solo exhibition of oil paintings and mixed media work. And then again, he wasn't giving up. He had four forums in 1958 and they put them on this poster. And um, if you look at them, there was now Feinstein is on them. And one of the interesting people that now they were focusing on was a dancer, Melvina Thais. And uh, later she liked to spell her name with an E, but I'm using the, she was I in all these things. So the first one was a discussion. And again, Louis Kahn involved with it, trying to connect dance with architecture, music and painting. And then the second one was actually a performance followed by discussion. Third one, now this was a different one. Again, branching out a physicist, Jungian analyst, a minister and an astronomer. These artists were interested in space, time, the new things that were happening in physics, all the new theories felt that was relevant to their art. And then the last one was um, Joseph Castaldo, the musician, and again, the dancer were included. So um, they did something different. In the early forums, Feinstein would ask people to chip in a dollar or something to help pay for it because they had to have refre maybe refreshments or they had to rent shares. And this time, if you bought all four tickets, you, could, you only had to pay $4. So here are the tickets there for the four forums in 58 and some photographs of uh, Melvina. It's a wonderful one of her jumping up when she was young. So there was a, really a lot going on in Philadelphia for abstract art. The third Philadelphia abstract artist exhibit was in New York. And um, this was something they were really proud of. And um, um, so Jane Piper again, all these, this again, the same artists that we've seen before, the beautiful paintings in the show. Um, I for, and um, the fourth one was at a gallery called Tian Xia, which is supposed to be something about made in heaven or something. And these were the, again, artists. There's a new one now, Harold Mezeboff, who went as Mesa. And you look at the poster for this that Bechtel had saved. Guess what the address is? 1319 Irving Street. So this was something that Dubin was trying now. He sort of set up a kind of a gift shop and then um, had a space for hanging shows as well. So here, here's the Philadelphia abstract art showing in that space. The fifth Philadelphia abstract artist um, was in 1960, um, included, um, um, they were adding people. Now, Leonard Nelson, who had been invited to come in, showed at this time. So again, they, they were really working on getting something every year. This is back at the Fleischer Art Memorial. The sixth one was at Mitchell Wagman's gallery. Um, that, that his Philadelphia galleries, which he had in two locations. And it, they added Samuel Mighton, who was also a, a printmaker in this show. Um, so um, 
and uh, he showed, he also next year showed Philadelphia and New York artists. There was, so he was showing a lot of the, this, this art in his gallery, he just had one for the Philadelphia abstract artists. Bechtel said the last that was the official Philadelphia abstract artist exhibition was the one in 1962 where another new person added was Tom Gunn, who's got paintings in the, in the current show. And they had it in these new buildings, sort of urban renewal buildings, Penn Art Center galleries. So they were looking around for different spaces. So by this time in 1962, um, the art was really changing. And I think both Bechtel and Feinstein were pretty dismayed by things like this hard edge painting, pop art, Andy Warhol, um, and um, uh, uh, and things like that. So that, and these were what were, were hitting the magazines. Critic Clement Brick Greenberg, who had really supported abstract expressionism, thought, well, that was getting passe. There were new things coming in, post-painterly abstraction. He even told Sam Feinstein that he should change his style and get with it, get with the modern times, which Sam Feinstein did not want to do. Bechtel um, actually, um, didn't want to go all these things. They were just really, as I said, dismayed by this. One of the interesting things in 1962, the Philadelphia why Arts Council was going to have a show of abstract expressionist painting in 1962. And instead of that, they pioneered and had a show of pop art, Fluxus, Nouveau Realiste, and Alan Capro happening in Philadelphia. So, you know, this was a big change, but it didn't stop a lot of the artists that had been in Group 55 Philadelphia abstract artists with sticking what they felt was important, what they wanted to do. There were some other shows that happened at the Fleischer Art Memorial where a lot of them were teaching, which were majority by people that had been in Philadelphia Abstract Artists or Group 55. And they had shows in 67, 68, 69, the, the posters for that last one. And many of them taught there. And that's sort of when my trail ran out for, you know, for the story of this group and these artists. So when Bechtel archived his papers, he put them in a big folder. And I just had to show you this. He, he's very clear, 1957 to 62 is Philadelphia Abstract Artist. It was originally Group 55, he said. Hmm. Of course, Group 55 actually kept going on. And he said, I was the director of the group. We had seven wonderful shows of non-representational painting in Philadelphia and New York. Group 55 and Philadelphia Abstract Artists exhibitions were the first meaningful non-representational shows in Philadelphia. Very proud of what um, they had done. So as I mentioned, the painters um, kept wanted to keep painting. A lot of them were teachers and they did have a big and continuing impact on Philadelphia. Um, so the forums, public forums, the exhibitions they organized changed and enlivened the, the whole art scene in Philadelphia. At one point, Dorothy Grafley was worried abstraction was taking over in the early 60s. There were so many abstract shows. They created a center of gravity for abstraction. They opened minds to people for the art of their time. And we don't even know, there were hundreds of people that came to the forums, the programs that saw their exhibitions. They brought attention to the validity of abstract painting and its connection to the other avant-garde forms in, in art. They raised the level of discussion, showed that abstract art was a force to be reckoned with in contemporary life and thought. The groups weren't large, like Group 55 had two dozen people, Philadelphia abstract artists more than one dozen people. As I said, they made a big difference in Philadelphia. Then also with the ones that were teachers, like Jane Piper was the teacher for decades at the Philadelphia, the Philadelphia College of Art, now the University of Arts, as was George Staffel. Feinstein taught his whole life. These people were teaching, passing on their ideas about painting, um, 
ideas like with Jane Piper that went back to her study with Carl's and with Hans, Hans Hoffman, Jane Piper's daughter, Jan Baltzel continues as a beautiful abstract painter. She's taught for years at the Pennsylvania Academy. Bill Scott, who's one of the wonderful abstract artists in Philadelphia is also exhibits in New York often um, uh, admired Carl's and Jane Piper and Keita Broadhead and as part of this whole stream. So the stream of beautiful abstract painting continues today, even though in Philadelphia, the whole history has been more geared towards representational storytelling art, which you can see at the Pennsylvania Academy, but there's abstraction here too. And these painters continue to paint for the rest of their lives. We're very proud of what they did, proud of their being in Group 55 and uh, con kept up that belief in the importance of making art. Um, the, uh, what I think is remarkable that seeing some of the paintings that we found in the show and finally getting to see them in person at the opening weekend, these are wonderful paintings. They're exciting to look at. As I said, you have to see them in person. They stand up to anything that was really being done in New York. You could say that these artists were part of second generation abstract expressionists, like artists like Joan Mitchell would be put into that category. But somehow they didn't get into the art history textbooks. They didn't get included in the books, many, many books about the history of abstract expressionism, which always focus on um, New York. And, um, but the, you know, the quality of their work is, is so high. And in the question and answer thing, if any of you in the audience have ideas, why would this be? Why would we not know these people before now? Sam Feinstein, we know because in 1958, he left Philadelphia. He um, stopped exhibiting his work. He stopped selling his work, but he kept painting and teaching. And so nobody saw his paintings for decades and decades until now his widow is, is uh, published a beautiful book and is making them available for exhibitions. So nobody had a chance to know him, but these other artists as well are certainly worth, worth knowing. So again, it's the idea of how, why, why is this? I'd be interested in your ideas. Um, You'd be interested that um, in the show, there are some artists that were not actually part of either of those groups, but were invited to be to join and didn't like Larry Day, Paul Keene um, and Melville Price. And, but they were probably going to the forums. They were there, they knew the artists, they were part of the whole scene. And then there's some others that were included because they were painting at the same time, interested in abstraction, but not, um, uh, officially part of either group. So it gives you a sense of what was happening in Philadelphia. And you'll notice when you see the catalog that a lot of these paintings are now in the collection of the Woodmere Art Museum because of Bill Valerio's um, goal of really highlighting uh, art in Philadelphia. So it's, uh, this is a wonderful part of the story of the show too. Just to, I thought you'd be interested that Bechtel had showed you his painting earlier, but after this time, around this time, 1962, he stopped painting oil painting and he started uh, doing wonderful exploratory work on paper, sometimes starting with a splatter or a splash of paint or an ink blot. And this is one of his, and he kept painting like, uh, painting like this, very dedicated for many years. A lot of these works on paper did end up, he did end up getting them in a museum. And Sam Feinstein, of course, continued doing larger and larger canvases, building up more textures, still working with this idea of just painting with color, making this these wonderful, wonderful paintings that you'll see in the Immersive Abstraction Show. I wanted to end with Keita Broadhead because even though she was one of the oldest members born in 1901, she was able to have a hundredth exhibition in New York. And here she is at the opening. I was able to write an essay about her for the catalog. And she kept, as I said, she, she studied with Carl's longer than anybody. She kept changing, thinking about her art, trying new ideas. And um, like the, a lot of the Group 55 artists, she was interested in ideas and science. 
She would read things about space exploration. This is a photograph at the bottom from the Hubble telescope, which I think probably in at least subliminally inspired, inspired some of her paintings. This is one of her late paintings, Whence and Where To. The idea of where is, where's the world going? Where's humanity going? Maybe where the human spirit is going. And um, as I said, really, uh, still, you know, connected with things that were discussed um, very way back in the 50s in Group 55. So the catalog will be coming out hopefully by the end of the month. And it's got wonderful essays on not just as mine, one by Pat Feinstein. There's nice, good introduction by Bill Valerio and one about Louis Kahn and about dance and one about music. So it will really give you a much fuller idea of what all this was about. And um, I've enjoyed tell talking with you about this. And I hope many of you will get to see the show and uh, enjoy the work of these passionate artists who were in this group launched by Sam Feinstein, who did so much at the time. Um, anyway, thank you. OK, Hildy. Somebody? Yes. Well, Barbara, um, it, it, a chat just came up saying, thank you so much. It was wonderful, Barbara. It was fabulous. Now it makes so much sense after seeing your wonderful exhibit at Woodmere Art Museum. Can't wait for the catalog. Bill, enjoy Florida. This is from Pia um, Drugan. Drugan. So um, thank you, Pia. Yeah, I mean, it is a, it is a beautiful show. And it's, what a fascinating story. We have a question from Catherine Renzi. What is the relationship, if any, between Clement Greenberg, the critic and writer that you were talking about, and Sanford Greenberg, the artist? Do you know if there's any? No, just the same last name. I, 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 no connection. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, another one. Very exciting talk and art show. Thanks so much. What it's what a story. I mean, it's amazing that this rich world where all these artists and musicians and dancers and, um, you know, doctors, pediatricians, scientists are congregating and they're having forums and 200 people can't get in, you know, it's, and the other thing I find so fascinating is the store windows at Blum Department Store, exhibiting these, these this artwork with fashion and, um, and, and it being so accessible, you know, past the store window and be able to see it. It is, it's, it is fascinating that um, with all the enthusiasm of the time that certainly, you know, you, you know, you, you describe that we don't know about Group 55. So I'm very glad that you did all this work and that Woodmere could have this exhibition because it is, um, it, it's a beautiful exhibition. So I, I did one of the things I wanted to say was that Michael Silliberti, who did those store windows, was asking Bill Valerio apparently for years to do a show on Group 55. He was a wonderful man. In fact, I talked to him and got a beautiful quote from him, which I have in the catalog. It turned out it was just a few days before he died at age 94. When I met him, he said, I hope I'll live to see the show. He didn't quite make it, but he knew it was happening and he was a big part of it. And so I dedicated my essay to him. That's nice. Barbara, I have, this is Bill and mm -hmm. um, I have a question for you. Um, you know, when we think about the 1950s, you know, we think about a fairly conservative time socially in American culture. And I wonder, you know, I mean, I, I you know, in, in my sense, these are artists who really are seeking to, to change their social context, to change, you know, to bring about change, you know, in specifically in the city of Philadelphia, but they have a faith that art can move the needle uh, socially around them. Could you talk a little bit about just the, the, the social forces that you see relevant to, you know, the work of, of this group. How, how are they sort of typical of their time in the 1950s or how are they atypical? How, how do they fit in or not? 
with their well, Maybe you can answer that one better than I can, but um, oh, I was a child in the 50s, but uh, to me, it was like these people in all these different intellectual fields that were friends, they were talking together, they were meeting, they were all excited, they were feeding off each other. And the other thing is one thing we got in the catalog was a map that showed how all these galleries and places were in kind of in center city. A lot of them lived down there. People were walking. I mean, it was a much smaller kind of closer community. Some of the people lived out in the suburbs um, and, um, you know, they wanted connection. I mean, these artists were painting alone in their studios. They wanted somebody to look at their work, discuss them. They didn't all have galleries. They were entering jury shows, but, um, you know, it, was, it really gave them uh, a, a lot of, uh, you know, sense of support and validation for what they were, were doing. Barbara, there's a question from Charlie. Um, Group 55 was all about educating, opening up their art to everyone. And in New York, it was a closed universe. Why did they develop so, so why did they develop so differently? Well, as I said, Philadelphia environment, I think was different. There was kind of even the tradition of Quaker things in Philadelphia, people caring about the community, the public, sort of a really different sense of a very different way of interacting with each other, I think, much more kind of civilized. You could say it was sedate, but it was also civilized, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's, a, that's it's, it's an interesting way to think about it. Um, from, um, from our Pam Luce, who is, um, one of our cohorts at Woodmere, after the breakaway from Group 55 to create the Philadelphia Abstract Artist Group, did the members of each remain on good terms and continue to interact much? I think so. We, we have evidence that like Michael Silberti bought tickets to the forum. I think they were still, they were still friends. They were still interacting. I don't think it was um, a bitter thing at all. I think they were all you know, going to the, each other's shows and going to the talks and probably the concerts and things mm -hmm. that Feinstein was doing. So, I, you know, but it was more, Bechtel was very, um, you know, his very strong opinions. They both, he and Feinstein both had very strong opinions. Bechtel actually in 1961, after the Philadelphia Abstract Artists show just didn't get a good review, uh, tried to start another new group. You know, he always was sort of looking for perfection or I, he was very idealistic in terms of what he was doing. And he didn't think everybody was abstract enough. So he, you know, he had, and he would write letters to the newspaper and make corrections and things like that. He was, um, you know, that maybe that engineering mind, he wanted things right the way he saw them being right. So, but he was, his, uh, all the papers that he had about how they organized the exhibitions that were so clear who was on the committee who was going to do what how they were going to judge them who was going to hang them what the deadlines were it was all very clear you know and organized mm -hmm. interesting um, another question or comment um, it is a question many questions come up regarding sam's relationship with the academy the mention of yale could send him into a funk but Khan was closely associated with Yale. How much of Sam's reluctance to collaborate and associate with Academy caused a break with public accept acceptance? This is from Benny Meggs. Okay, I don't know a lot about that actually. So that's maybe something new. I don't know about that. Mm -hmm. Oh, wait, we have more chats, just a second. Um, let's see. Okay, um, this is from, um, I think, Ani Maiden to all the panelists. Thank you for the very interesting and very well-researched talk. My father was Sam Maiden, who mm. said he joined the group in 1960. I guess that he was brought in by Sam Greenberg or maybe Louis, Lou Kahn, both of whom were good friends. I know my father and most of those he knew were, were about sharing ideas and expanding minds. And Clement Greenberg, from what I've heard growing up, was not a friend to artists. Perhaps the perspective came from those who were not moving into the pop art realm. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's a wonderful. Thank you. Thanks for being here. Yeah. And let's see, from Sherman Aronson, seeing a show that merged painting, sculpture, architecture, music, 
was a great breakthrough and seeing it all recreated at Woodmere was wonderful. These days, performance art and conceptual art sometimes combine media in one piece, but to show all these disciplines in one setting is still novel. So, I mean, I mean, I think it does, it does, it, it does sound like a quite a unique group of individuals that just kept expanding and being receptive to new ideas and integrating it. And I find it interesting thinking about today and the title of Keita Broadhead's painting, Whence and Where To? Um, it could be a question for us right now as well. <laughs> Definitely this week. Yeah, come on, Philip. Come on, Pennsylvania. Keep counting, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, hey, thank hey, you, Barbara. Hey, Go hey, ahead, Bill. Oh, I'm sorry. I I wanted to just jump in because I I was thinking about the question that um, Benny Meggs asked about the academy, and I don't know if I can speak to Yale specifically, um, but but I can speak a little bit. And I I think Barbara, you talked about how you know, artists like Arthur Carls and Keita Broadhead, to some extent, Jane Piper, probably defined their identities as artists in contradistinction against the Academy. I mean, that this story mm -hmm. of abstraction in Philadelphia is, you know, in Philly, it, it's running counter to the main flow of the story of the arts, which is about realism in the arts and narrative arts and illustration arts. Philadelphia is a newspaper town. And so there's a lot of illustration arts in Philadelphia. You know, these are the artists who are, you know, I would say going out of their way to not be academic. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know if that answers the question at all, but I think that they're, they're putting distance between themselves and, and the Academy. And, uh, you know, um, I don't think I'm saying anything that you didn't say in the lecture, Barbara, mm -hmm. but I, mm -hmm. uh, I, I feel that um, it's, a, it's a good question. And again, I don't know about, you know, Lou Kahn and Yale and, um, you know, how to quite answer that in relation to Group 55, mm -hmm. but, I, but, but in terms of the, the Academy as an institution in general, you know, these are artists who, you know, are, are trying to express themselves as artists in different ways. Yeah. Well, anything else? Okay. Well. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wait, we do have something else. Mother said, this is from Charlie. I'm guessing Charlie Broadhead. Um, mother said, whence and where to was about where she was painting herself, where she wanted to go. Oh, good, thank you. It's still it, metaphorical for our time. <laughs> yeah. I, I have to say it is so wonderful and such an honor to have so many of the children of artists mm -hmm. who were involved in Group 55 on this talk tonight. Um, yeah, I mean, we just had another comment from Ani. I also think this group speaks to the friendly nature of the Philadelphia art world. I love that the artists were working together. So they all got shown and got exposure. My guess is New York may have been more competitive. A good point. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and I think, you know, as New York galleries just grew and grew and grew, it also, you know, just became much more about commercial success as well. Not that that's bad. I know I'm not trying to say that that's not, that that's not a good thing, but it, it you know, it was a lot about money. I wanted to say one thing I left out because I got, got going here that I thought was a good ending for, for my talk. At the New Dimensions of Man um, Symposium, the show that was up around them was Arthur Carls. That's why Dubin, had, when I went to talk to Dubin because he had shown Carls. And in a review, I th the quote I think was really good and kind of a good ending. Carl's modest fame is an inadequate index of the extent of his in influence and of the quality of his paintings. An impressive percentage of today's leading Philadelphia artists studied under him at the Pennsylvania Academy. He brought to them direct and unsullied from impeccable sources in Paris, the gospel of modern art. The city's flourishing harvest of non-objective painting is in part the fruit of his labor. Brings us full circle, Barbara. That's mm -hmm. great. 
Thank you. Thank you all for coming and um, please come see the exhibition. You can go to Woodmere's website, um, woodmereartmuseum.org. You, um, you can reserve a ticket online or you can come to the door and um, we are you know, um, very aware of safety. We've implemented many safety measures, but um, it's likely you would get in without a problem. <laughs> so please come. It is a beautiful exhibition. Thank you, Barbara. That was wonderful. This is an important story that you've pieced together. You know, I, I am awe inspired by the synthesis of so much mm -hmm. you know, firsthand research and, and just information that, you know, allows us to continue to build on the wonderful story of these artists, uh, so many of whom you know, need to have their fuller stories of their, their work explored. And I think you've laid the groundwork for a lot of doctoral theses could be written or museum exhibitions. Mm -hmm. It's a very exciting show yeah. for so many reasons and we are all so grateful to you. Well, so thank you for supporting it and thanks especially to Pat Stark Feinstein, tremendous, her tremendous support in so many ways. And it's been fun to work on. It's given me something fun to do during COVID, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah. Full of color. Mm -hmm. Good color. Thank you all and good night. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm. Bye-bye.